A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. John the Baptist appeared, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem, all Judea, and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now, the ax lies at the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for repentance but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When we hear John the Baptist really laying into the scribes and Pharisees, maybe it's just me, but I like those passages because we feel like this, this sense of righteousness kind of wells up in our heart. Yeah, give it to him, Lord. Or, or sorry, here it's John the Baptist. Look, Jesus would do it later. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, you hypocrites. And there's these passages like the, the ax is lying at the root of the tree, and we're just getting ready for that tree to get cut down and thrown into the fire. Who warned you, you hypocrites, you brood of vipers? It's really strong language. And just imagine, this is coming from John the Baptist, and they're trying to approach him to receive what he's got to give. This baptism, everyone's going down there, and they're curious, they're, they're wondering, they're intrigued, yet at the same time, they're cautious, and they're measuring, and they're cynical. But the nice thing about the scribes and the Pharisees is that in Scripture, they're a stand-in, for all of time, for those people, those people. And for us, those people, them, it can be any, and I'm gonna go through the whole spectrum so that everybody gets triggered and, and nobody uh, thinks I'm pointing at them. You can have, for, for sometimes them is the alt-right and these ultra-conservatives and they just, uh, these unyielding principles that they don't have any mercy and there's no heart and there's no under real compassion and they're just so rigid and and it's them, they're the scribes and the Pharisees. Go to the other side. And those progressives, and they're just so, they just all these crazy ideas. There's all heart and there's no head, and they just, these things, and they're gonna, they're gonna burn the world down. Like, just, it's there, it's they're the ones that, and just in case anyone feels left out, those centrists. Just a little bit of head, a little bit of heart, and no courage to really stand up for what is they're just trying to measure out and balance, and there's no, they're the ones that ought to, everybody. But as soon as we start crossing our arms, 
And it's that index finger comes out. And it's them. No, it's them. Guess who's the Pharisee now? The Pharisees make such a great stand-in because it's all of us. It's not the them. It's we. It's us. We are the Pharisees. Now, obviously, we all fall, have, we're, just no, we're not all just absolute corrupt. There's, there's goodness in all of us. But at the same time, we realize that in all of us, there's something's wrong. I mean, what, why do we do these things? Why do we cross our arms and point fingers? Why do we go to these different extremes? Why do we lack courage to stand up for what must be stood up for? Why is there evil in the world? Why, do we, why are we the ones doing it? In a certain way, all religions are in some way or another trying to answer that question. What's wrong with us? And how do we fix it? What's the solution? In our Judeo-Christian tradition, we recognize that the very fact that we're able to ask the question, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with us? Means that there is something that there is a harmony that should be, but which is not. A harmony that should be, which is not. Where do we, when did that go wrong? Well, we point back to the, we use mythical language to speak about it, but we're pointing back to a, some kind of a spiritual reality that took place of original sin. And so there was this original harmony with God and with creation and with each other, and it wasn't a struggle. It wasn't a, there wasn't a labor to make that happen. We weren't constantly veering off into these strange directions. But with the fall, and to, to use the words that uh, Pope, Pope Benedict, Emeritus Pope Benedict used once, he said it was like there was a drop of poison that entered the bloodstream of humanity. It's a great description. Because it gets in there and it's like an infection that you can't just, it gets passed on throughout all of humanity and you can't just get rid of it because it's in there. It's, it's circulating around. A poison entering the bloodstream of humanity. And so where there was harmony, now there's tension and now there's adversity. First of all, with God. We, we struggle to pray. We struggle to even relate to him well. We do it better and worse at times, but it's not easy. And we realize there's this thing that draws us to God, yet we feel this, but there's also things that draw us away, and it's internal to us. There's also tension with each other. It's not just with God, well, then it's with each other. And so even inside of where you would think there should be the most harmony, there can be also tension there inside the family between spouses, between parents and children and other relatives. There's tension. Now, it can be better, it can be worse, but it's not a complete, harmonious, glorious union. There's also a tension with the rest of creation, with the world. We struggle to carve out our existence in the world because of the forces of nature that in a certain way seem to be against us in one way or another. Why do, why do viruses come along and wipe us out? Why do earthquakes and fires and, and this trying to balance out the environment and what we're doing? It's, it's not easy. And then lastly, and maybe this is the worst of all in a certain way, is that there's an internal intention inside each and every one of us. The way the poison affects us internally. Our, our minds aren't able to grasp reality with clarity with ease. We struggle to do that. And we come up with strange answers that are off the mark. Our, 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 our mind is clouded in a certain way, not like what the angels or God has. There, our, our heart, our will, to put another word on it, it, it veers off from the good that, that we, we try to direct it towards, but then, nah, I want this over here. St. Paul speaks about doing the evil 
he knows he doesn't want to do and he does it anyways. And the frustration that he experienced in that, we've all got that in ourselves. Those of you who have, have children, it, it like wells up out of us. Those of you who have, or have had children, little children, which one of you taught your child to lie? Like taught them, okay, now this is the truth, but I want you to say this. Nobody does that, nobody has to, because kids do that automatically. That's messed up. But everybody does it without even being taught. And then lastly, there's, there's this tension in our, between our body and our soul. After a while, our body, little by little, starts <laughs> to use the very appropriate phrase, starts to give up the ghost. It wears out and says, tell you what, I'm done here. And our soul has no place to be after that. Well, God takes care of it after that point, but so it's this world of tension in which we're all the Pharisees, and it's not just because of we're just a bad person. It's because we're messed up. There's this internal tension that we can't save ourselves from. We can't just take that and make a decision. You know what? I'm not, I'm not going to be like that anymore. If somebody knew how to do it, great. I haven't seen it. Humanity hasn't seen it yet. Well, one exception, any other exception. But it's in this world of tension, strife, internal suffering, external suffering, that's where Christ comes. We have this longing for things to be like what Isaiah was speaking about there in the first reading, this great harmony on, this, on his holy mountain. The, the, the stump of Jesse, the bud shall blossom. The Spirit of the Lord will come down. The wolf shall be the guest of the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the young lion shall browse together with the little child to guide him. It's using poetic language to describe a perfectly harmonious situation. And our hearts long for that. We want that. We need that. And we can't get there on our own. If we could, we would have done it already. God doesn't wait. God didn't wait for us to get that worked out first. He didn't wait till the moment 2,000 years ago when, okay, now there's no more wars, there's no more hunger, everyone's getting along, there's nobody steals, nobody cheats, and everyone prays just right, everyone worships just right. Now, okay, now, now I'll come. That's not what the situation was then, that's not what the situation is now, yet he comes. and he comes as a baby. He comes in peace. He doesn't, yes, there will be a moment for the rod of his mouth slaying his enemies, for the brood of vipers to be put in their place. There will be the moments for that, but here this morning, our Lord comes in peace. There's a, a theological reality, a way of looking at the mass, that every Mass is a celebration of Christmas because God descends from heaven and becomes flesh here on earth, on the altar. It's also a Good Friday. It's also an Easter Sunday. It's all those things. They're all wrapped up in one. But in this particular time of year, it's, a, it's, it's a particularly advantageous to think of it as this is a Christmas. This is the Lord coming to me in my tension, in my stripe, in my sorrow, in my suffering. He comes in and he wants to heal from the inside. That's why he wants to actually literally go inside us. It's physical. It's spiritual. It's both. 
but we need to open ourselves up to receive that. We need to let our guard down so we're not like the Pharisees coming in, well, let's see, and let me just measure this out, judge it, uh, let, me, let me see if I really want to do this or not. Those who went to John the Baptist there in the desert with a completely open set, Lord, I am a sinner. Heal me. Forgive me. That's why we start out each Mass that way, too. We have the, we have the act of contrition, and then when the Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison, Lord, have mercy. Christ, at Christ, have mercy. That's what we're saying there. So we want to make sure that as even as the beginning of the Mass, we're doing that same thing, like going out into the desert to see John the Baptist. We're, we're going out with a contrite heart. So we have to make those words our own and not just listen to the choir sing. No, make a meditation on it. That way it lasts out. It's not just, I mean, in a, a weekday Mass, we just say it. But here we get a chance to meditate on it. And the same with the act of contrition at the beginning. I confess to Almighty God. We're, we're recognizing the truth of our situation. We've been poisoned. And we add to it as well. So here at Mass, we come to the Lord, asking Him to come in and heal, forgive, strengthen, console. And little by little, He begins changing us, transforming us. And you already experience like there's this harmony that comes that, that there, there is no great feeling like uh, uh, Huckleberry Finn, the author, um, Tom, uh, sorry, I, I just total, Mark Twain, sorry, yeah, Mark Twain, right, Mark Twain. He said, there's, n there's not, not such a good feeling as getting out of church. Now, now he meant it because it, for him it was a labor to be in church to begin with, and now he's finally out. But there was another truth that he was kind of pointing out there. It's like, when you get out of church, it's like, yeah, like something's right in the world, and there's something right in me, and there's, there's a harmony that I have now that I didn't have walking in. So, but that comes with, that's not easy. We still have to work at that. We still have that tension with God. So, but, but through prayer, through being here, making the sacrifice, through just thinking about these things, meditating and opening our heart to receive the Lord in communion, he begins to save us and transform us and preparing us for that, to be on that holy mountain, which we can experience some here on earth, but ultimately in full in heaven. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.